This is going to be about Outkast. I am curious if any of y'all haven't listened to all four of their first albums at least. And if you do, drop drop a comment and let us know what your favorite is. This will be interesting. I'll just do this real quick before we hop into the second half of the show. So this is by Matthew Daniels. Uh, it's also on my Twitter, um, at Rep, Rap Fred Rogers, which you can find this if you're interested in it later. Uh, if you're interested in Outcast, you should like this. And if you're not familiar with Outcast, man, you know, use this as a way to get going, man, because they're pretty fucking great. So let's see. Moving on. So this is, uh, he's done a series of, of graphs um, to kind of like show what Outcast is doing here. And the, one of the uh, cool things they're starting with is uh, the birth of Southern slang. So Outcast is commonly referred to as like the beginning of a lot of like mainstream Southern rap, which is now so dominant. And, uh, you know, instances of crunk was such a huge thing, uh, uh, an era in the early 2000s, like Little John before we got to trap. And so what you're seeing, and, and Outcast is not crunk, but it's like they, they definitely paved the Atlanta lane. And no one else was really making shit out of Atlanta, except for maybe Too Short, who moved from Oakland to there later, but still, again, later. And uh, you can see here, um, they've actually tracked uh, Skeet, Crunk, and Playa. And uh, you can see in the black dots, AT Aliens and Southern Playalistic. And you can see that they basically, there are a few cases of uh, Skeet and Crunk in particular, but basically once those albums hit and Big Boy and Andre started uh, using those words, which most audiences had never used before, look after that. Look at the impact and the influence they have made. And with players, less so, but like, damn, after Southern Playlistic, it's like a straight red line. And I'm going to say, uh, you know, in that player line, who's, in, who's those first three uh, red dots? That's probably too short from Oakland, so there's also some connection there. And you can see the time course of that. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, let's keep it moving. Uh, you can check this out later. Uh, the, then, you know, a lot of the times if you're an Outcast fan, you, you hear, uh, you know, the area like East Point College Park is a little quick little map of that Tri-City area. We'll just uh, skeet through that. <laughs> Uh, this is one of my favorite ones right here. So this is a graph of the um, percent of tracks on Outcast albums discussing uh, different subjects and topics like guns, drugs, the South in general. Um, they definitely coined the term Dirty South with the track Dirty South. Uh, pimps and cars. And so if you like any of these albums, if you're familiar with anything, any of these albums, it's kind of cool to see the breakdown of the subject matter. We were talking about like audience appeal and subject matter. So that's kind of broken down there a little bit. References to the South are pretty consistent for the first three albums. Uh, they then go down each album as Outkast gets more and more popular. That's not surprising, I suppose, as they're trying to be more global. A similar p pattern with the drug and gun references, it looks like, uh, except for like gun references, peak with Equemini, I guess, which is my favorite album. Um, interesting that Equemini is pretty much the only album with no pimping references, that red is suddenly gone, and uh, at least until the last album. And that's pretty much uh, all big boy, the pimping side, for sure. Um, and around Equemini, his aunt died, who was kind of like a mother to him, and he talks about that in some tracks. Um, so maybe that's why, part of why this album is so different and interesting, at least to me, I think that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and surprisingly, the order of my personal favorite albums is basically predicted by car and lack references, Cadillac references. I would just switch the AT Aliens and the Equemini, and that's like literally this like is exactly the same as my ranking of their albums. So let's see, let's keep going. You can uh, look at the different themes that are brought up with these albums highlighted by Matthew Daniels. Hit him up too, man. He does amazing work. We covered some of his... Uh, stats before in the past and this last one is a creative focus of andre and big boy this is less of like a real chart more of like a figurative kind of generalized chart so you can see down here big boy in the green and andre in the red they both start with funk inspiration uh, and you can see that big boy kind of stays in that lane continuing to explore different like funky sounds while andre's creativity uh, creativity changes to singing and jazz and question mark. Um, now he's known to just show up in random airports and places just playing the flute. For his, dude's an interesting character. And uh, they're pointing out that you know the perfect blend might be right there in the middle, somewhere around Stankonia, where they're kind of on the same page, but there's enough contrast stylistically and creativity that there's like a good marriage there. And then they might be growing too different eventually, which might be why they kind of effectively broke up if they're really on a different page. I mean, I consider Outkast the Beatles of hip hop. 
personally. So if you don't know, you need to get up on it. And uh, for for reference, the original recipe they had after that first album was uh, Andre made the beats, Big Boy made all the hooks, and I felt like that was a real good marriage there. Um, the first album was exclusively produced by Organized Noise, who made tracks for them after that. Organized Noise is a Hall of Fame producing group. Uh, they did a lot of TLC's uh, stuff, for example. <laughs> 